So now we want to take a look at how do we actually apply linear equations to word problems? How do we make applications in the real world with linear equations? We've been finding the slope, we've been finding the y-intercept and writing linear functions, but we want to actually be able to look at a problem, read it and analyze it, and then come up with an equation or a function that describes that problem. So all of this that we've been doing so far directly applies to what we're about to do next. Take a look at this problem and see if you can actually write a linear function that describes what's going on using C of B and um, for the cost and using B for the number of books. So hopefully you took a look at it and just tried this one out. I know we, we haven't even talked about how to do it, but the main idea um, behind a lot of these problems is just looking and seeing, okay, what is the slope? What is the y-intercept? And a lot of these problems, they're going to ask you, what is the domain of the function? Um, because now we're kind of getting into ones where you're going to start looking at the problems and they want to know what is the domain of this real world situation? Some values of the x value or whatever the independent variable is are not going to make sense. So um, I'll, I'll show you what that means in a second. But for this particular problem, what I will tell you is that if you ever read a word problem and they're asking you to come up with an equation with a linear equation um, when you see that per that's almost a dead giveaway that that number is the slope so for every single book um, that you sell you get thirty dollars okay so what we could write this as c of b is equal to thirty times b so for every book we're getting b or sorry for every book <laughs> we're getting thirty dollars and then if you notice this extra $50, that's not dependent on how many books that you sell. You get $50 whether you sell zero books or whether you sell a thousand books. So that's why this kind of goes over here as plus 50. Now, technically you could sell, you know, an infinite number of books, not really, but you could sell, you know, a million or two million. So we're not going to cap it. But what I will tell you, when you look at these and they ask you to say, um, to see what the domain is, this becomes more of a common sense type of thing. If you think about it, we could sell zero books, but we can't really sell negative books. I can't sell a negative one book or a negative five books, right? So what we'll do um, for the domain is we'll say B is going to be greater than or equal to zero. And that makes the most sense. So here's our linear function. It's equal to, it, it's in the form y equals mx plus b, except instead of y, we're using this function notation. Instead of x, we're using b. Okay, and that's exactly what it looks like. So look for your slope, look for your y-intercept, and then look at the problem and say, okay, what could the domain be? So let's try another one. Okay, give this one a shot, and then we'll come back and work through it together. Okay, so I see we've got a, a maple tree currently standing at five feet tall. They tell us that we want to find the tree's height, h. I really should have put h of t for this one, h of t. Um, what I'll show you is if you look, it grows at 18 inches per year. Again, you look at this problem, and if you see that word per or for each, that's almost always a dead giveaway that that's going to be our slope. So in, in this case, we're not using x, we're using t and the slope goes right on that, that's an eight, <laughs> it goes right on that T. So it's equal to 18 T, and in this case, it's already five feet tall. So initially, even if time is equal to zero, even if no time has passed, um, you bought it when it was five foot tall, five feet tall, excuse me. And so now we can analyze um, whatever the height would be after T number of years. And again, if you look at this, T could go a certain number of years into the future. We're not really sure how much, but we do know for sure that it could not be negative. That just would not make sense in this problem. So I'm going to say that the domain for this one is all values greater than or equal to zero. And again, that's really what they're asking for. If you're asked to find the domain of the function and they don't explicitly give it to you, they're kind of asking a common sense idea of the domain. So we know that the time wouldn't be negative here, just like it wouldn't be negative in the previous problem that we did. And if you notice, this is our equation. That's all that we have for that one. So it's really looking, finding the slope, finding the y-intercept, and then determining what makes sense for the domain of this particular scenario. So let's try another one. Now read through this one and see if you can come up with the, the questions um, answers and uh, see what you think. And then we'll come back and work through that. Okay, hopefully you gave this one a shot. This one, if you notice, it's a little bit different. We already have the equation. We already have a function representing whatever's going on here. We're renting an office building with a particular formula, and they want to know what does the slope represent, what is the y-intercept, and what is the domain. So hopefully you came through this, and you can actually plug a couple of points in for t. t is the number of months. 
and find out for every single month we're paying an extra $1,000, that 1,000 is our slope. So that's, you could think of that as the monthly rent. The slope would be the monthly rent for that one. For the y-intercept, what happens when t is equal to zero? We get 1,000 times zero, that's gone, and we're left with this. So imagine if you didn't even, just to get started, when t is equal to zero, we have to pay $2,500. So you could think of that as a down payment. The $2,500 would be your down payment. That's a good way to describe this one. And also, if you think about it again, we don't really know how long into the future we're going to be renting this uh, office building, but we definitely know for sure that time couldn't be hopefully thought negative. It just doesn't make sense in this case. Time wouldn't be negative. We, we just don't, we don't work with negative time for the most part, until you get into physics and that's a different story. <laughs> but for this one, our domain would look something like t, whoops, t is greater than, greater than or equal to zero. And again, that 2,500, I'll probably type this out so you can see it. 2,500 represents the down payment and the slope of 1,000 represents the monthly, whoops, monthly rent. And that's pretty much it for that one. So let's try another one that has to do with that. We get a, an equation and we're asked to kind of analyze what is the slope, what does that represent, what does the y-intercept represent, and those types of problems. Okay, so try this one out and then we'll go back over it in a second. Again, hopefully you gave this one a shot. Again, they're also giving us, notice they're also already giving us the function that represents the value of a new car based on time t, where t is the number um, of miles represented in units of 10,000. V is just the value of the car. So if you look, if you see what the slope represents, T is um, the number of miles, I, I should have put M for T, um, but T just, you know, we'll talk about, I don't know, 10,000 really is for time. But in this case, for that particular variable, every single time the number of 10,000 increases by one, the value of our car decreases by 800. So if you notice in this case, for every 10,000 miles that we drive, our car is depreciating in value by 800. That's exactly what that 800 represents. So I'll write this right here. Let's use a different color. That 800 represents the decrease, I can't type today, represents the decrease in value for every 10,000 miles driven. That's what that represents. And if you look, imagine T was equal to zero our value of our car would just be 24,000 because the minus 800 times zero, that would disappear. It'd be 24,000. If you think of it, that's just the initial value of the car. So the y-intercept of 24,000 is the initial, whoops, the initial value of the car when we buy it. And if you notice, I, I tried to trick you on these ones. It's not MX plus B form, it's just B plus MX. I switched the order of those. That's perfectly fine. You're going to see that. They're going to try to trick you on that. I want you to be comfortable in knowing the slope is attached to whatever the independent variable is, regardless of whether it comes first or whether it comes next. Okay. And then for the domain of this one, we can actually find um, both the beginning and the ending value. Um, and what I mean by that is, again, time in this case, or um, mileage in this case wouldn't make sense for anything that's negative. So T would have to be greater than or equal to zero because we could have, whoops, <laughs> zero, because we could have zero mileage on it. Maybe it's still on the lot. We haven't even bought it yet, but the car is going to equal zero dollars at some point. It's going to be worthless at some point, and we can actually find that. So what, what we're going to do is we're going to plug in zero for V of T and see what that is. Now, you might not be asked this, um, anytime soon, but I do want you to know how to find this because this um, is something that you would be expected to know. So let's say we had 800T and we're trying to find out when the car's value is equal to zero. Well, I'm gonna bring this whole 800T over to the left side. And if you remember your one, two, multi-step, that's a zero, one, two, multi-step equation, this is all we're doing for this. I'm gonna divide by 800 get rid of that on both sides. This is just a nice, these zeros cancel out. 240 divided by eight, T is equal to 30. So once we hit, um, what is that, 300,000 miles, our car is gonna be useless. It's gonna be worth zero dollars. Now that's not really true in real life. A car is always going to be worth something. It could be worth at least, you know, $5 or something like that. But for this particular problem that they give us, um, it would be worthless technically based on the problem after um, 30,000. So we would say T is greater than or equal to zero. Um, and it's also, or sorry, greater than or equal to, and it's also less than, let me put the T over here. 
t is less than or equal to 30, but it's greater than or equal to zero. And that would be our domain for that one. Again, technically cars do, they're worth something even after 300,000 miles, but you get my point. Look at, we wanna look at the context of the problem and try and analyze what is the domain for that. And if you notice the trend, usually we're not dealing with negative numbers for our um, independent variable. And that's usually all we'll need to put. And for this one, you probably could have even just put this and, and been okay with that, and that would have been fine. But I do want you to see that sometimes we will have an upper limit on our domain, okay? And sometimes we have to calculate that. But that's pretty much it for analyzing these problems. We'll have some practice in the description as usual because these are kind of tricky when you read the problem. They ask you especially, what does the slope mean? Interpret the slope, but that's all we do. I want you to be able to identify, first off, what the slope is, and if you notice, it's usually what's next to the per word or for each, that number is going to be your slope and then analyze what the y-intercept is as well, and just be comfortable reading the context of the problem. So hopefully this made sense. I hopefully this video gave you a little bit of practice on what's going on, and make sure you try the practice problems in the description box, and we'll see you in the next video.